So, hello everyone. Uh, so, presentation. This presentation is uh, about a project that we are lucky to be able to do uh, in partnership between, well, Blue Square, the company I'm coming from. So, I'm Martin Van Aken. I'm Blue Square CTO. So, mostly, I'm the person which is more on the software development side. I'll come to that in a minute. The other area of the company is more public health side, and for this project we worked closely with the university, the Free University of Brussels, which Moritz Lenetz, which is here, has uh, contributed a lot. So quickly we'll speak very fast about who we are. Well, I'll tend to speak very fast, generally speaking, but I mean I'll, <laughs> I'll try to restrain myself a bit. Uh, explaining for those that don't know what's the She Decides program, and the question we were asked to solve as some kind of data partner uh, there. The issue we face, the approach, and a wrap-up about what we learned there. So about Blue Square, so we are a health data company, so we are mostly from the public health sector. It's not, we are not exactly a GIS company, but to be honest, the problem of access to health comes more and more also to special problems. It's not enough to say that there are supposedly enough maternity in a country for the number of women if, for example, maybe 10% of them can reach one because they are too far or they are uh, not located properly. Uh, as a company, well, we, are, we strive to build data systems and tools to help to get health resources where they matter the most, which means we are overwhelmingly involved in low-income countries, in areas where the healthcare situation is the more difficult, mostly due to a lack of resources in pretty much every direction. Uh, we are around 30 people. We've been working in projects in 24 countries, and we are ourselves uh, based in Brussels, but we are working daily with people on, I think, more than eight countries today. Uh, so, again, on this project, we were able to work with two academic partners, Free University of Brussels, for which Moritz, Moritz is from, and the University of Namur, which is another uh, university in the small Belgium. So, to start, maybe, who knows here about the She Decides program? Can you raise your hand? Heard about that? Okay, one person. Uh, so to put a bit of history, because I had to read myself, this is linked to something called the Global Gag Rule, which is a USA-based policy that come back to Ronald Reagan, that said that any NGO operating or providing any kind of service linked to abortion will be forbidden to have any kind of money from the US government. And this policy has been disabled, removed by every single Democrat president and reinstated by every single Republican president since that time. So up with Reagan, uh, down with Clinton, up with Bush, down with Obama, up with Trump. And uh, on this last up part, uh, there was a reaction by, uh, at the time, Dutch uh, Minister Pl Plumman to say that the other countries should do something to, in a way, compensate from the fact that the US were actually removing a big part of the fund. Knowing at this time that since the time this global gag rule has been in, in, in effect, uh, the effects are known, which is that it's not re reducing abortion at all, and it's actually raising more, uh, augmenting the number of unsafe abortion. Why? The NGOs which are blocked fund that because they provide abortion services are generally speaking providing a lot of other services about uh, contraceptive, about education, about and so obviously if they don't get, get fund, they don't get fund for anything. And so the actual result, even for the people that think this is a good idea, is actually counterproductive and it has been known for years. But well, still there. So the she decides, so this initiative was followed quite quickly and ended up being a 200 million fund uh, from a lot of different countries in order to say, okay, we are going to step up so that those funds still exist for this kind of initiative. Um, and so this has become a global movement about women's rights. Right. The small part, the very small aspect in which we are concerned, has been called As She Access, and it's a collaboration between Blue Square, ULB, and UN to tackle data issues related to women access to health services. So the question we got is surprisingly simple. How many women between 15 and 35 live more than one hour from a healthcare center with maternal care? From there, any idea what do we need to be able to answer that? Typically speaking, in, we were typically in, in sub-Saharan countries, even if the question could be asked everywhere, but what kind of data are needed if we want to answer this? I mean, seemingly si si same. Yeah, location, clearly. What, what else? 
Sorry? Yeah. We, we, we have traveled because it's obviously made that it's one hour. We didn't say 50 kilometers or 10 kilometers because that doesn't mean anything. So, typically, we need a list of the health center, <laughs> obviously, uh, with their location and the service they provide. We need an idea of where the women are, so the population distribution, and we need an idea of the travel time. And in the end, all of them are actually problematic. So before reaching to the list of problems we get in data, I want to emphasize something. It's easy to be critical about the sorry state of the data availability, especially in the countries we're working with. Now it's to be understood that those critics are mostly not linked to an absence of will, to an absence of capability, but an absence of resource. This is from the Western European Y guy that I am, uh, one of the health centers I visited in a DRC when I was lucky to go on the field. And this is the area from which the people that we, as data partner, the World Bank, the Shidi Side Fund, everyone pretend to be helping, which is the first line of defense, which are the people working for those health centers in conditions which are generally extremely difficult. Uh, lack of good material, lack of staffing, uh, lack of running water. I'm not making that up, unfortunately, not even speaking about lack of power. And on the other side, we, this whole group of people that want to improve this situation are asking them to answer a lot of survey. Coming to even survey fatigue, you see people there with a huge pile of paper they had to answer. So it's just to say, yeah, are there issue? Yes, we need an understanding of where this comes from. So we need a center location. Okay, problem, you have a public registry. Those are incomplete. Uh, even from official government services, you don't have all the data. The location is missing, or it's actually not correct. Uh, the external data source, when they exist, are difficult to match because naming or codification doesn't exist or is uh, uh, partial. Location is yeah, missing. Private and community-based centers are typically providing service without being visible. You may think by looking at the government map that there is a whole area without any services, but maybe there is one. It's just not gov government sanctioned. And maybe it does actually a pretty good job. So there's a lot of holes there. What can we do? We work with the local government and the organization there to support the collection, the update, and the publish of health center list updated. As the kind of ca tools we are using is tools such as Open Data Toolkit that allow to generate survey easily to collect GPS coordinates. It's not a GIS tool, but it's enough for what we need. And so this data can be get back to a, a central position. We need the service provided. Why? Because again, even if you have the list of health centers, you need to know what services are available there. And available like in real life, not available on paper. Uh, that could be that not every maternity is able to provide the effective service at the level of quality you would expect. Maybe they are understaffed, maybe the material is not there, maybe they are supposed to provide uh, contraceptive, but it has been weeks they didn't get one because there is stock out. So, we try to complete the data collection with questions about the actual services available, knowing that it changed with time, but that it's a place to start. Uh, we upload the result to DHES2, which is an open source data warehouse, which has become a sort of common place in the health, public health sector, and so that it can be used. Uh, and we show the result on a publicly accessible portal in agreement with the funding government we're working with. The data are theirs, not ours, but generally speaking about what they are okay to show. So that, this is a small example, it's in Senegal with the list of services that are available with the capacity to drill down to see exactly what's available where. Population. Uh, we need the data source at the very local level, raster. It exists on many sources, which is good and bad. The government census is often old. And speaking of DRC, which is the area we know the best, it's often quite bad also. Um, uh, you have the World Pop models, but they are models, and in some situations there are reason to think that the result is not exactly what we expect. And when, when we do local collection with programs, for example, that do massive screening that need to go village from village and identify everyone, when we compare the data to the one that the government is giving us, we have differences. And I'm not speaking 20%, I'm speaking 100%, uh, which makes some trouble about notably any attempt at coverage. How many women are covered by the program? Depends how many they are. And that's a complicated question. What do we do? We compare sources to evaluate data quality and at minimum to be open about the possibly bad quality there. Travel data, you have the data layers. We are more into GIS here, road, land cover, elevation. But the results are highly sensitive to data source. If you compare, this is an example with four different data sources, and if we take the proportion we get from 
16 to 24, so we have a difference of 50% depending on what source we use. So once again, uh, we have a problem with the data at hand. So Maurice will be to explain what was actually done on the model. Thank you, Martin. Yes, so um, quite quickly, just to show you practically what we did to, to answer these questions, or especially that one question that Martin raised. So first of all, maybe just a, a short talk about the, 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 the notion of accessibility. That obviously when we speak about accessibility to any kind of service, but including obviously health service, there's very different aspects to accessibility. And so you might actually have issues also of socioeconomic access. Can you pay the service? Uh, uh, things like that. Um, is there enough actually uh, supply, things like that. But what we have been focusing on right now in, at this stage in this project is, let's say, the spatial relationship between locations of supply and demand. So we are not looking at these aspects of socioeconomic accessibility. We're aware of them, but they're not covered at this stage within the project. So the general methodology is for people in GIS world, quite simple. There's nothing really we invented here. Um, but I think it's important to be able to implement these kind of methodologies in tools which are used in different communities. And so it's actually a cost surface approach. So what we do is we, we collect a series of information, uh, especially on land cover and road data. And from that, we then create cost surfaces about how long does it take to go through each pixel, let's say, in, on, of, our, of our area. And then from that, we can then estimate the accessibility cost to health centers from all the different parts of the country to the closest health center. We then can delineate catchment areas of these health centers. And then again, overlay, let's say, the, the isochrones, so the distance to these catchment areas, so to get then, if you want to, catchment isochrones. Um, so from each health center to see what is the zone which is let's say, within the catchment area of this uh, health center and is 30 minutes away, 15 minutes away, whatever. We also try to take into account the fact that in several of countries that we're covering here, so the, the project right now, it's on Senegal, Bina, and part of, of the, the um, Democratic Republic of Congo, um, with the idea, obviously, of extending that to, to other countries is um, that in some of these countries you have huge differences between wet season and dry season of where you can go and where you can't go and how fast you can go. And so we try to estimate that in a very simple way by using actually, uh, let's say, uh, watershed modeling and, and, and uh, water accumulation modeling based on, on, on uh, digital elevation models. This is a very imperfect way of doing it. We're very aware of that, but it's very difficult to get any other kinds of information on that. And then out of that, we then have the two different kinds of catchment isochrones, wet season, dry season, and we overlay that over gridded population data. And again, as Martin just said, we still have the problem there that we don't know how good or bad this gridded population data is, or we know that very often it's not very good. But still, I mean, the UNAMUR partners we have, they're, they're the ones working intensively on the world pop uh, maps, and so they, they are trying also to improve that. And, find new ways of modeling that. There's new efforts now that we, the idea is to integrate that, or to test at least, is Facebook now has actually brought out a population layer, but in some of the areas we looked at, we're not 100% sure what is better. Um, they actually start from some of the same source data as we, so I'm not sure that's that different, we'll see. So the output then looks like this. You have different scenarios. So here you have here's examples with two different road uh, layers, and you have dry season on the top and wet season on the bottom. And so you can already see, if you look at the, uh, compare the two uh, with car, so sorry, there's also on the top it's with car and on the bottom is no cars, because that's the other question, how do people actually get to health centers? And that's another information we don't really have. And that's some discussions we've had with Blue Square as well, is it possible to collect that information from the health centers that they actually ask their patients, how did you come? How long did it take you to come here? So that we get some form of validation also of this, because uh, it's very difficult to, to get this. But so you can see even uh, the same types of access, road-based access, you can see differences in the maps depending on which road layer you use. And that explains the, the, the differences we saw um, earlier. Obviously, when you look at, let's say, uh, pedestrian access, the difference is not as, as big. So which tools do we use for that? Very simple, GRASS GIS uh, wrapped in Python code. Um, 
we started out working with Blue Square with a template in a Jupyter notebook so that could be easily just run and, and, and tested. And then we, we took the final results and put that into a simple command line script uh, or Python script. And if you look here, you've seen the main models that we used. Um, so you have the R cost model, which is a highly optimized model on for, for cost surface calculations and which immediately also gives you the catchment areas, which is interesting. R cross for overlaying those, uh, you have some zonal statistics tools. The R stream extract model is, is to, to get this idea of where we might have issues with during the wet season. And then obviously there's issues of, of reprojection, things like that you might actually neglect, but when you take world pop data, which has absolute values per pixel and you reproject that, you suddenly might lose 100,000 of your national population just through reprojection. So these are things you really have to watch out as well when you deal with this kind of data. You can't just reproject as you want. You have to work through data, transform it to densities, reproject the densities, recalculate the absolute population, things like that. Next to the maps I just showed, these are the types of results we're also looking at. So one is based, let's say, uh, on health centers to actually have an idea. So what these, these diagrams there show is the part of the population within the catchment area of every health center that is at a given time of distance of that health center. Um, and we're looking at a whole series of other indicators which are then based on the, centered on the health center. You have these aggregate statistics, obviously, which are interesting, let's say, more for policy issues. What is the proportion of the population, which is, let's say, at 120 minutes, 240 minutes, whatever, of a health center and things like that. Um, the idea is also to then test, you know, as Martin said, we sometimes have availability and out of services. So to be able to just, okay, we take away this health center now because we don't have that service again. Up to quickly be able to update the map and see, see okay, what, what effect does that have? Or if we put a new health center here, what, what does that bring us? Um, so, uh, just to wrap this up, um, as you can see, just a very simple question actually creates a lot of issues. Uh, and so we, we had to deal and still are dealing with a lot of these issues. And that does not mean we can't do what we're doing. But we have to be very careful about it and with these results and what we do with them and how we present them. It's obvious that what we're doing here is not ground truth. This is modeling and, and this has to be quite, quite clear. And obviously, <laughs> one main message out there is that if institutions share the data and put them out there, it makes it easier for all of us to do this kind, do, do this kind of work. And so, I mean, be it feeding the health center data that uh, Blue Square collects into OpenStreetMap, or be it that, that uh, other providers share what they have, it's an enormous work normally to actually just get some data set going. And so it would be great if we had a bit more data sharing, data infrastructure to do that, obviously. We're not inventing really new things here in terms of GIS techniques. As I said, this is quite basic uh, elements. And others are doing similar things. So Andy Nelson presented something last year at the Phosphor G using R. And I think it's interesting to see that, that um, there are these different approaches and all of them with open source. So anybody can reuse them and retry them. And, and uh, um, it's good to have this, this ecosystem that we're slowly building up of tools which can be easily integrated into, let's say, more domain-specific usages of institutions which are not used to working with, with spatial data and GIS, but that we can just give them the tools that they need to, 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 to do the job. So that was it from us. Just a little invitation. We have our local phosphorgy in Belgium in October. So if anyone is in the area, don't hesitate to, to show up. Thank you. No? Yeah. Um, thank you very much. Are there any questions? Yeah. Thank you. Um, have you reached out to any of the UNFPA country offices in doing this work? This is the UN Population Fund. It's exactly what we are doing uh, in these countries, and it's, it's part of the mandate of the organization. So have you had any discussions? And we also have projects that we are implementing in this direction, so we should talk more, but uh, I'm just wondering. 
as far as I know, and that's no, and that means that's probably no. To be honest, uh, coming from my part from the software development world and reaching progressively, the amount of initiative is staggering to the point where it's frightening because, I mean, or if I take just the case for the list of health centers in DRC, I, we remember work from a university in the US, they integrated 10 different sources just with a list of the health center, which should be the initial most simple part of this problem. So, but happy to, because, well, as we said, the most people are working on that, and if we talk and if we share, <laughs> we may get somewhere. But thanks, <laughs> I'm curious about the work there. Maybe just one answer to that as well is the, in the initial phase of, let's say, elaborating the project, there was a presentation which was done in New York at the UN General Assembly, so there have been discussions at that level uh, about this. Yes. I mean, mine was kind of similar in the HDX, as in humanitarian data exchange exists, where organizations upload and share data sets around humanitarian things. Like, and I, yeah, it just, it was essentially the same question of if that was a source that you looked at, and maybe it's the wider problem that there's too many data sources that aren't collected in one place. I'm afraid pretty much the same. Uh, in, indeed, and even having a repertoire for a given region about what exists and what is a, yeah, a complicated problem at this level, as looks like by in, a, in a room with 40 people, we, <laughs> we just have three already between us. So. How is the OpenStreetMap community in Congo, and how uh, do you consider to um, work with them to improve the data? Not about health centers, maybe, but maybe the roads, and everything, transport. I, I was going. It's the other ways that, uh, especially with this conference, again, we are looking about on one side what can we get from OpenStreetMap, uh, like health center, for example. We have other project linked, for example, for wash problem, and we saw the <laughs> those those people from Uganda showing some some data from OpenStreetMap with water access, even if it's on the other side, we could push what we have, and that will be clearly a. This is something we, we <laughs> where I took note of uh, for, at minimum, the part that we think we have good data, which in our side is probably health facility registry, because that's promote, if there is one area we think we may have something that is a relative good quality, and if not unique, that we have probably a good idea is probably that one. Yeah, just to add to that, I mean, one thing, this is a very small project, so we don't have the means to go out and, and do training, whatever. And, um, the other thing is also, as far as I understand, a lot of the data collection on health centers done by Blue Square is done within projects that they are doing for the national governments. And so it's not necessarily up to Blue Square to decide can, where can we put that data. So it's also a constant negotiation with, let's say, the funders, the, the, especially the national governments, to accept that their data is open. And that is also a, a big issue there. I mean, at ULB, we have a training course, a six-month training course in GIS with free software where we have people coming from mostly African countries actually every year. And we train them also in OSM and, and, and usage of, of free software in GIS and stuff like that. So we're trying to contribute to building up slowly in uh, OSM communities and GIS, free GIS communities in that way. Maybe one more, yeah. In addition to this problematic, we need to convince the people paying us that it's all for which the data own part to share. It works for a subset, generally speaking, but this comes in addition in the middle of a complicated relationship in health program between people with the money, the World Bank and external fund, and the Ministry of Health, where there is a reasonable defiance between each other for partly good reason, including that is the citizen of the country and the data about those citizens, and so that the country will typically be relatively defensive about it. Notably, for in some situation, for good reasons. I mean, it's so typically we try to get into the aggregated level where, for example, list of health center, no one can really say that we are. It shouldn't be a problem, but it's still a negotiation. If they say no, that's like, we don't have any mandate to push them. We can talk, but yeah, that's <laughs> if we cannot convince them, we don't have the, any, any power to do more. Okay, then more questions now. One more round of applause. Thank you.